Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Life Positive Show. Tonight, we have a very special guest with us. She is none other than Dr. Tripti Jain, who needs no introduction. She is known the world over for her past life regression therapies. She is uh, known very well in India for her uh, show called Ras Pisli Jaramka, which was aired in 2010 and, and which had made great waves all across. So, Dr. Jain is also the founder of Setu, an organization that facilitates inner learning. She also practices NLP, spiritual numerology, and transactional analysis. She has been working with ATAP, the Spastic Society of India, since 1984, developing various psychometric tools for challenged children. So, uh, welcome to the Life Positive Show, Dr. Prithi. It gives me great pleasure to see you tonight. And Thank you. All, all our readers are uh, very fond of you and are looking forward to listening to you, to this conversation tonight. So Dr. Jain, please tell us how you stumbled upon the therapy of past life regression and what has been your journey in life so far? You know, when you use the word stumbled, it means accidentally. Okay. So that's exactly what happened in my life. It was an mm -hmm. accidental stumbling that took place. Uh, I used to work in a mental health facility and I used to see patients like having phobia and OCD and schizophrenia, depression. So one, this, this happened 22 years ago. So a young girl came to see me who had OCD, who had obsessive thinking, which was related to something that she was disturbed about because it was to do having sex with God. Mm. So she had this obsessive thought and mm. she was going to get married. Mm -hmm. So she was uh, worried that, you know, if I have this obsessive thought, how will my kind of marital mm -hmm. life be? Mm -hmm. So during the session of just hypnosis, mm -hmm. she actually went so deep into trance mm -hmm. that she started experiencing a memory mm -hmm. uh, which she was unaware of and nor was I aware of it because she had never experienced this in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that's when my first experience of a patient having past life therapy experience really came up. Mm. So after the session was over, I was wondering like, what, what was all this? Because at that time I wasn't trained mm. in doing a past life session. Mm. So the session got over and she was sweating profusely and she was shouting during the session. After that, uh, I, she asked me, ma'am, what was all this? Mm. So I said, you know, uh, maybe it was just a deep rooted memory and it's come out. So it's maybe mm. it will get you better. Mm. But I thought the session was a failure. Mm. <laughs> but interestingly, she gave me a call two weeks later and she said, she's absolutely fine. The thoughts have just disappeared. So I was like, how did this happen? Mm. And that's when my search uh, into the world of past life therapy began. And I felt that definitely there was a doorway that had opened for me and I needed to probe further. And then I think a couple of, just a year later, my father passed away. And uh, I had a midnight uh, visitation from him, which again was very, very surreal for me because mm. I'd never experienced something like this before. And that's what moved me, you know, to finding out more about the higher dimensions that existed. Mm. Mm -hmm. So these two experiences, which were accidental in a way, mm -hmm. um, they just uh, changed the way. my perceptive. Yeah, I just changed my entire perception of life okay. after that. Okay. So what has been your greatest learning through all the PLR sessions that you've uh, undertaken so far, which you've facilitated so far? What has been uh, your realization about the condi human condition? Well, what the first thing is... Yeah, sorry. The first thing is that, you know, you have to scrape the surface mm -hmm. if you have to go deeper. That's the first realization. As a psychologist, we work in a very kind of cognitive framework. You know, we just try and look at thoughts and emotions and beliefs. But there is something deeper that is uh, related to our spirit. So I did realize that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. I mean, that is the truth. Mm. I also realized that, uh, you know, death is the biggest myth mm. that is circulating around because mm. when you do a past life session, you, re you realize that there is no death. The soul can never die. 
Mm. And the art of dying needs to be taught along with the art of living. Mm. I really believe that now. And mm. also that uh, we haven't really lived as humans mm. all the time. In all our uh, uh, incarnations, we have mm. had animal bodies and plant bodies and even stones and mountains for that matter. Mm. We have had experiences mm. in all these realms, which mm. is something that I realized, you know, that uh, why are we so stuck with being humans and so proud of being humans, you know, mm. because we've had other experiences also. And the mm. other thing is the theory of karma. It is true. Mm. It is true that as we sow, so shall we reap. I mean, mm. this is something that a past life therapist will understand mm. as uh, the person starts working further, you know, and humanity divided on uh, lines of culture and religion and caste mm. just uh, just kind of vaporizes, Shivi. Mm -hmm. Because you realize that you have been in different, you have been different genders, you have been living in different cultures, you have mm -hmm. absorbed different kind of religious philosophies. Mm -hmm. So what is the reason for this hate? Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot understand that, you know, and maybe anybody who does a past life session and experiences themselves living in a different religion will mm -hmm. vouch for this, that mm -hmm. their um, uh, ability, I mean, they're not ability, I'd say that their uh, prejudices will just go away. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very important, you know, and this whole philosophy of Vasudeva Kutumbakam is mm -hmm. true. Uh, so a past life therapist understands this perfectly. So there are so many insights mm -hmm. that you develop. During okay. this process. So as we grow up, Dr. Jain, we are often taught that uh, it's uh, it's a matter of great fortune to be uh, born in a human body. It's only because of your bad karma do you uh, get to born in an animal body, which is a form of a punishment. And it takes much longer, like uh, 84 lakh incarnations to get this body. So yeah. is this a myth which has been uh, perpetuated over the years or is it a fact? And if so, then really, what are the advantages of being a human as against being an animal or a plant or, a, uh, you know, an inanimate life form? We have to understand one thing, that the soul is not the body. Hmm. So that's the first understanding. So if the soul is not a body and it's just um, energy, hmm. then energy can um, percolate or penetrate hmm. any body. Hmm. Mm. any physical form right so mm. it can be a plant an animal a human anything mm. now obviously karma plays a very important role in all this mm. so your basal emotions like violence like anger mm. uh, disgust jealousy mm. these mm. basal emotions mm. have to be experienced mm. now i have to experience all these emotions it's not only mm. i have to experience only being kind and benevolent and loving right because mm -hmm. all these navarasas make who i am mm -hmm. and it helps me to grow as a person it helps me to uh, recognize if somebody is upset or somebody is angry or somebody is worried if i don't experience an emotion of anger how would mm -hmm. i know somebody is angry it's not mm -hmm. possible right i have no experience of it mm -hmm. so when you experience lifetimes in these non-human forms mm -hmm. you experience these basic emotions, mm -hmm. you know, what we call kind of primal emotions. Mm -hmm. And when you experience them, you understand these emotions better. Mm -hmm. And so when you enter a human body, you're able to recognize these emotions. Mm -hmm. And slowly over your human uh, incarnations, you learn to work with them. Mm -hmm. You learn to work with these various vasanas, as they call them. Mm -hmm. Right, or the kind of glaciers. Mm. So it's important to experience yourself in non-human forms mm. because um, they have a diff they have a denser experience. Mm. Mm. You know, so these dense emotions are also required. It's like polarity. Mm. You know, I have to experience the good, but I also have to experience the bad. The mm. bad is not the bad actually, mm. but mm. it's just another experience for me to understand. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, when I get pulled in two different directions, will I be able to understand balance? Mm -hmm. So to understand balance, I have mm -hmm. to have experience in different forms. Mm -hmm. 
So okay. this is very important. The other thing she may have realized over the work is that a lot of uh, sicknesses, like let's say um, sticky sicknesses, which don't seem to go away, mm. uh, asthma, mm. you know, a person who has asthma or migraine or rash or uh, cough and cold and stuff mm. like that, it, I mean, the doctor can give you some medicine, but again, it's going to come to you. Mm. Mm. Indicating that this illness or this sickness is so deep rooted that this could be coming from a non human lifetime. So, I'll give you an example you know, of a woman who had a sneezing problem. Mm -hmm. And she saw herself in a boulder, not as a boulder, but in a boulder, because mm -hmm. the soul is not the object, right? Mm -hmm. And this boulder was in a river on which, you know, the cold water of the river was flowing on the boulder. Mm -hmm. And during the whole experience of about an hour, she was sneezing. Because the, the experience of coldness mm. was being was being felt by her. Mm. And when I guided her to say, okay, maybe the experience is over and you need to leave the boulder, mm. we will not believe that the sneezing stopped and she's never had the sneezing again. Mm. Indicating that we do have these experiences mm. where we enter non-human forms mm -hmm. and we learn something from it. See, it's not a punishment, you know. Mm -hmm. This whole idea about a lifetime in an animal body is punishment. Mm -hmm. It could be. It could mm -hmm. be. But that is also karmic mm -hmm. where you have chosen it. Mm -hmm. you know? But basically, it's an experience that you're having. We are filled with experiences. Mm -hmm. But these are very, uh, very tough experiences, Dr. Tripti, because in the human form, we have much more freedom to alleviate our suffering or a condition if we want to and if we are really serious about it. Now, if somebody is experiencing a life in a boulder or in a rock or in a tree, that's a very limiting experience. You can experience the suffering, perhaps you can even experience a pleasure, but then you're so helpless to change your situation. You cannot kind of move about or seek help or or uh, you know, do a any form of sadhana to uh, overcome this experience or get better. So that that uh, I, I do feel that you know can be very uh, can be a very li limiting as well as a very difficult difficult experience chosen by any uh, soul to undergo. So, so Shri, Shri, let me tell you, it is not a limiting experience. It's okay. an up, it's an uplifting experience. Let me wow. share one of my past lives as a tree, which I have experienced. Oh my God. And the learning, the learning that I had from that lifetime is when you are helpless, help. It was the deepest learning that I had, that when you are helpless, the only way out is to help others. Hmm. Now, who can give me this experience? A human lifetime maybe cannot give me this experience, but a plant lifetime, a tree lifetime where the tree has been chopped away, and all the birds have flown away. And now I have been reduced to logs of wood. Mm. And I, what is the point now of staying in this tree? Right? Mm. And I could feel the pain when the tree was being chopped. I experienced mm. that pain. And then when my consciousness left the tree, I could hear the sound of my spiritual guide when I asked, what is the learning in this? Mm. And the spiritual guide told me that in helplessness, help. That's your learning. So in this human body, that's what I have done in my life. I've helped whenever I felt helpless, a helpless person came into my life and I helped that person. And I learned how to cope not only with my helplessness, right. but, with, but with the uh, helplessness of what my patient felt. So these non-human lifetimes can give you a lot of insight. But obviously the session has to be guided so mm. that the person gets the right insight. Great. I, I do remember Dr. Jain meeting somebody, a great spiritual master, who, who told me something very similar. Uh, she said that you people consider your uh, life form as the highest. You don't even know the, the extent of sacrifice which the non-human forms, they do just to uh, you know, maintain your life. Do you do you even realize that you know the cup that you're holding in your hand, which is filled with hot tea, it is experiencing that hotness, it is experiencing that heat, yet it is letting you drink through it and it is not kind of falling apart or breaking into pieces just to resist resist that heat. Same as with so many other things in your life, you don't even know. So they all have that consciousness of of, of experiencing pain or pleasure or 
or any other emotion only thing is that we do not resist as much as humans do so that's a huge uh, misconception that humans have that they are a higher life form that's not so so uh, is it true uh, dr jain according to absolutely i think humans uh, you know a, a, an experience of being an ant would be a lot of hard work an experience mm. of being a python would be laziness an experience of being a tree would be to uh, be giving because whatever i have people are going to take it away from me right mm. so that the loving kind emotions that these non human forms have and when you experience that it gets kind of embodied in you mm. it's very important to experience this human beings have what we call an ego mm. this ego is the problem actually that i am doing it you know the basically human beings suffer because they have what we call doership mm. i have done this i mm. am i am very intelligent and i am very clever and i am very pretty this doership is what has destroyed human kind mm. so otherwise i don't think we are that uh, intelligent just because we can read doesn't mean that we are intelligent mm-hmm. yeah of late there have been studies that if dolphins are much more intelligent than human beings and their their brain size is kind of much larger and they have certain portions in the brain which are missing uh, in humans only thing is that since they don't kind of exhibit their intelligence in the form of technology or any other way so you feel that they are inferior beings no they are much much more sync with the universe than human beings are that so cut off from their own reality so that is a very interesting thing just to add to this what you said Correct. our vision is 6 by 6 right hmm. but there are dogs Mm. can see further than 6 by 6 i'm sure or there are other creatures in this world who can see beyond what we can see bats for that matter mm. can hear things beyond 20000 frequency hertz mm. we mm. we cannot so mm. we are actually limited people very mm. limited human beings are very limited human beings mm. you know so, i was reading somewhere that there is a flower called the susan flower or something mm. and a butterfly or a bee can see spots on that flower that the human eye cannot see and they come to know from that how much of nectar the flower has i mean do we have that sensibility or sensitivity no we don't so we are very limited people you know i always tell people that human beings expect love from another human being but a limited human being cannot give love to another limited human being you can only have limited love mm-hmm. so yeah. this whole concept of having unlimited love unlimited things from a human being mm-hmm. a normal human being i'm talking about okay so you have to work on yourself that is why the word evolve is related to humans mm-hmm. it's not related to plants no we, we will not say that plants evolve Hmm. human beings evolve in th- indicating that we are not evolved <laughs> we are evolved. that's so true so but it is also said dr jain that we are blessed with that uh, uh, so so the vertebral column or that uh, nadi you know, which can uh, take us to the uh, state of self realization if we yeah. apply ourselves to it which is uh, uh, not present in other vertebrates which which cannot uh, sit straight or keep their spine erect so is it true that this is the only advantage we have over other life forms that if we really uh, decide then we can really know ourselves in much better way than any other life form can which is our oneness with the entire uh, i think existence a soul, a soul has taken this birth in a human body mm-hmm. because it has passed through so many different experiences and mm-hmm. it has realized now that there is more than mm-hmm. just having an experience of in a body there is more that i want to do this mm-hmm. desire has got us into a human form mm-hmm. and so now that we have a human body we have to respect it mm-hmm. and not only that we have to respect others also other forms also and now we have the chance to evolve we have the chance to raise our raise our vibration we have the chance mm-hmm. to become more kind more divine more benevolent more giving mm-hmm. we have the chance to now think of others than ourselves as as a uh, animal 
we will mm. think of ourselves, right? Is mm. my greed, my brood, mm. right? Mm. Because we will kill for our cubs. Mm. Mm. We won't kill for somebody else's cubs, right? Mm. But human beings have the chance to be charitable. Mm. I mean, that is such a wonderful uh, uh, quality that we can develop. So this is the reason. We have to respect the fact that we have a human form, a human mind. Mm. Mm. We have certain qualities, values that we can develop. And we can be of use now to others. Mm. Not only that our flesh is going to be of use to others, mm. but much more mm. that we can give right. others. Okay. So coming back to PLR, Dr. Jain, I also want to know there's a lot of interest in PLR. And most people... Uh, who may not even be needing PLR, they just want to have a glimpse of it and want to know what they were in their previous lifetimes and what has led to their uh, current situation in this lifetime. So do you think, no, it, I feel oftentimes that it has become a kind of a pastime or a hobby. Okay, let me go and find out who I was in my past life. So do your uh, clients uh, run the risk of getting trapped in this uh, um, the cycle and not coming out of it because eventually it's the present which is the most important thing and we need to learn how to be how to make the most of the current life and the current time that we have however i do see that often people they get lost in those past cycles they are unable to come out of it so uh, what what is your take on this so is it advisable for people to visit their past lives or you know or they should be avoiding it as much as possible because of certain uh, Oh, no, the hazards or which might be uh, embedded yeah. in it. See, past life therapy is not can comfort food. Mm. Mm. It cannot be used for all problems. That's right. the first thing. Second, there are certain um, contraindications. Mm. You cannot use past life therapy with, let's say, a person who's having schizophrenia because the person is already dissociated. Mm. He's mm. already mm. living in a world of fantasy. Mm -hmm. So how can you do a past life session with such a person? She was just going to give you some kind of stories from her own fantasies, you know, can help mm -hmm. her because she's anyway can hal uh, hallucinating. Right, right. So contraindications should be followed. Most, uh, uh, most therapists are not from the field of psychology or they are not doctors. So mm -hmm. the problem here is that they are doing therapy on clients where it is not required also. Third, mm -hmm. uh, past life therapy is a deep rooted therapy where it is not only the session, Shivi, that matters. It mm -hmm. is the closure of the session that matters. Mm -hmm. How are you closing the session? Second, mm -hmm. how are you integrating the mm -hmm. learnings that you have got from the session in mm -hmm. your present? Mm -hmm. Because like you rightly said, the power lies in the present. Correct, correct. So how are you working with the past memories in the mm. present so that, the, so, so that your future can be better? Mm. So the past, the present and the future is simultaneous. Mm. It's not that the past is separate from the present, right? So how am I going to integrate all this? This is what a therapist needs to learn. Most important is this. Mm. So it is not that everybody requires past life therapy. You know, and second and most important, I have to say this, is that there are sometimes, um, there are a lot of therapists who give away the audio tape, mm. like they've recorded the session, let's say, mm. and the, uh, the, the client asks for the rec recording, mm. and mm. the therapist gives it to the mm. client. Let mm. me tell you, this can lead to a lot of problems. Why? Because the client has a habit of listening to what has been experienced. Mm. Not only that, some clients are so, uh, you know, kind of uh, enthusiastic. They mm. will get their spouse to listen to it, mm. then their parents to listen to it, then their mm. you know, other family members to listen to it. And this has happened with one of my clients that in a fit of rage and argument, mm. uh, the husband told the wife, Are tu aisi thi. from your past life, you are like this. And the argument got worse. So a therapist needs to understand some uh, ethical principles. The problem is that past life therapy is not being taught in a university. So it's a lot of pitfalls. Hai. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that 
the age and the condition which which the client comes. I'll give you an example. A man came to see me, 82 year old, mm. and his son had passed away in an accident, mm. and he was kind of uh, crying about the fact that at my age, look at the you know mm. grief that I have to go through and all that. Mm. Anyway, he did a session. He came to know. And uh, after that, he insisted that I give him the recording. Though I told him I'm not going to give him the recording, but you know, he was he was very uh, difficult. So mm. I said, okay. I said, but you don't have to listen to it. Mm. But you know, they don't listen, right? So he started listening to the recording. After one month, his niece called up and said, my uncle has got depressed due to the past life session. Mm. So I said, can you tell me if he was listening to the recording? So she said, yes, he's been listening to it every day. Mm. I said, is it my fault? Please ask your uncle whether he was instructed not to take the tape and not to listen to it. She said, yes, yes. He said that, you know, ma'am ne bola tha not to listen to it, but uh, I wanted to listen. I said, so mm. now what do you want me to do? So he said, she said, he wants to come and meet you again. I said, okay, ask him to come. Mm. So when he came, he said that uh, I've got a lot of insight, but you know, I've become very depressed because in his past life, he saw that he was the cause of his son's death in that lifetime. So the mm. guilt that he felt, mm. he had completely integrated that guilt in the session, but by continuously listening to that over and over again, every day, that memory had unnecessarily become more active and he had got depressed. After that, we did another session with him and then he's, he's fine. So this is, see, ethically, a therapist has to work, Shivi. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I tell you, a past life therapy, like you rightly said, can do a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very important that uh, therapists, because I know therapists are going to listen to this, mm -hmm. you have to understand that there is a need for you to be trained correctly, to use the training correctly and have maximum experiences with client. You mm. cannot be a therapist and see one client in one month and say you're a therapist. Mm. You have to see that you see a number of clients with a particular kind of problem that like you have in my practice. I will tell you if my students see 50 clients who have phobia, then they will learn how to handle phobia. You cannot mm. understand by doing one client, right? Because mm -hmm. every client is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So, experience you have to make teacher. So, this is very important, I want to tell everybody. Mm -hmm. You have become a past life therapist. Don't do it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. It's not a hobby. Take it up seriously. Mm -hmm. Let people know that you are trained as a past life therapist and go all out. Mm -hmm. You know, and get as much experience that you can get. Mm. That's what I would tell everyone. Okay, uh, Dr. Jan, this also brings me to another question. Uh, you just told us that uh, through these sessions, you've also learned that human beings have lived in many other bodies, not only in human and in different incarnations. Uh, were you able, uh, did you ever come across uh, experience where, where people have lived in other planets, other dimensions? as extraterrestrials and so uh, has this actually unraveled that other world to you and how all of us are interconnected and what is the level of human consciousness on earth or uh, our planet as a whole and how far we still have to go in terms of our evolution as compared to life on other dimensions can you just shed some light on this so as we say that our soul is divine hmm. So if our soul is divine, there are so many other dimensions where divinity exists. Mm. And between the earth dimension and the divine dimension, there mm. are many other dimensions also, because you cannot go from the human straight to becoming divine, right? Mm. So obviously there has to be certain other dimensions also which are there. Mm. Now, yes, as you asked me the question, have people experienced lifetimes in other dimensions, let's say mm. it is. Mm -hmm. living in some kind of parallel universes mm -hmm. yes people have experienced lifetimes in, in um like i'll give you an example of a young girl who had migraine mm -hmm. and uh, during a session she experienced that she was uh, abducted in a spaceship 
and she was taken away to another dimension and she saw these two beings mm. uh, she couldn't uh, recognize them as being humans they were very had their very thin bodies rather mm. they were more light bodies rather than physical bodies and um, they were in, they were inserting a chip in her mm. and they were getting data from her so during the session the chip was removed mm -hmm. and post that her migraine stopped not only that she had a lot of swelling when she came to see me mm -hmm. and she couldn't uh, digest food very well mm -hmm. and she was like uh, a loner you know she couldn't understand human contact very well mm -hmm. like uh, loyalty mm -hmm. um you know, even the food that she used to eat would not give her a lot of nutrition. Mm. So she obviously was somebody who was belonging to another realm and she had by mistake entered the earth realm. And she was unable to adjust to a human body is what mm. we realized. But mm. after that session, we did many sessions, we did about eight sessions with her because mm. she had many issues. And that was very early on in my work also where I used mm. to do multiple sessions now I don't mm. but at that time I used to and you know every session she got better and most of these people who come from the other realm eventually get into healing mm. because they are very powerful as people mm. you know their souls are very powerful they're able to sense they're very sensitive they're able to sense things very quickly mm. Mm. So if somebody comes to them they can sense their uh, um, energy very well so they eventually get into some kind of healing, channeling, mm. because that's very easy for them. You know, mm. they, they're not able to adjust to the earth realm very well. Mm. Over incarnations, because once mm. they've entered the earth realm, you know, they obviously enjoy many mm. other benefits also. So mm. over incarnations, maybe they will start getting adjusted. Many of them have a lot of problems with money, mm. finance, like banking, mm. saving. Why? Because in those other realms, uh, there is nothing like, like money transaction. Okay. So here it's all about money. You know, money is power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in those realms, love is power. Okay. So they're very loving people. They they get attached. They they're very affectionate people. You mm -hmm. know. So the earthlings who have, they have many incarnations on the earth can easily take um, advantage of these people. Mm. So that is why they kind of uh, live in their own shell, their own cocoon. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so all these souls who have either by mistake come to the earth or they've been pulled for some reason mm. or they have uh, come here for some experience. Mm. The earth is like a, it's like a, what should I say? It's like a banquet, you know. Okay. Like a banquet hall. Mm. You know, when you enter this place, you get so enamored and uh, pulled into the different directions stuff. yeah the beautiful stuff that this earth has to offer from your five senses become corrupted actually okay you know? so that's right. what happens here so yeah these souls do come in and there are so many of them here on this earth wow. today dr jain you spoke about uh, removing that chip so that was that phys uh, chip physical in nature which had to be uh, you know removed through operation or just uh, no, so you know how, simply by so how she explained to me was very interesting. Mm -hmm. She told me that uh, they are cre they are using their uh, fingers. Mm -hmm. so they had these fingers, okay, which was like light fingers, but mm -hmm. long fingers, mm -hmm. and these fingers had a lot of uh, um, energy. Mm -hmm. They were like kind of lasers. Mm -hmm. So they would just like you know do this, and they would just move it. Now the chip was not a physical chip. Mm -hmm. That's what she said, not, not a physical chip. Mm -hmm. It was just like a like a different a different a different vibration, mm -hmm. a different frequency mm -hmm. was there in that chip, and then they removed it. But mm -hmm. she could feel heat. Mm -hmm. That's definitely something that she said. She, mm -hmm. she could feel a lot of heat mm -hmm. when that when that was happening, when this mm -hmm. uh, operation was being done, or some kind of uh, surgery was being done. You know, mm -hmm. she could feel a lot of heat. And then she uh, felt much better after that. So it was a long session. I can't recall everything. Yes, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, also, uh, there are certain things which do baffle me, uh, especially when you see uh, 
uh, people from the LGBTQ community, which is uh, which is a very I, I think it's it's a very uh, difficult experience for anybody to undergo to be so different from the common law that you find it very challenging to find space and acceptance for yourself and you're mostly uh, shunted or labeled or condemned in so many ways why do uh, souls take up a life form like this where uh, it's very difficult for them to gel with other people and to face constant discrimination all through their lives it's very challenging what would be the reason uh, Shivi, whether it's an uh, <coughs> whether it's somebody who's experiencing an altered sexuality mm. or even somebody who is not experiencing one mm. you take a life where you are a victim mm. only because you have been a persecutor mm. so you will not just take a victimhood no you will not mm. experience victimhood just like for fun or something right mm. so you have been a persecutor Mm. And depending on the uh, manner in which or the quality of which you have, uh, or rather I would say, the, the way in which you have harmed others, you would want to sabotage yourself. So mm. if I have harmed people in a manner which has been maybe maimed them, mm. Mm then obviously I will have to maim some aspect of me. Mm. I will have to hurt some aspect of me, like a physical body mm. aspect of me, mm. right? a body part of mine. Mm. So this is what happens. We have to understand that whether you are belonging to any community, mm. there, the reason why you're experiencing pain and hurt is two reasons. One, mm. you have been a persecutor. Mm. Second, you are not able to get out of victimhood. Mm. You feel that is comfortable. Mm. You know, sometimes mm. being a victim is very comfortable. Most there of the time. People, Shivi, there are many people who, women especially, I want to mm. say, they come to me and they will complain about their spouse, their husband to me. Mm. They say that, and then they'll say, but I will go to you know, after all, he's taking care of me. After all, he loves me. After all, he buys things for me. So I'll remain a victim. I'll remain in this particular relationship. Mm. So either you've had multiple lifetimes as victims. So that energy has grown inside you. Mm. So you are unable to shake it off. Mm. So there are these reasons why you continue uh, in this... Uh, you know, playing roles rather, mm. where you continue feeling victimized, either through your physical body or through some emotion, mm. or you're not having children. So there's social stigma, especially mm. in our culture, mm. or there is uh, separation and divorce that's taking place and causing you hurt. Mm. The moment you are hurt, it means you have hurt somebody. You cannot be hurt without hurting anybody else. It's not possible. Mm. That's not how the law works. That's not how the universal law works. So uh, have uh, any uh, such people ever come to you for past life regression, wanting to know what made them uh, be born as transgenders or yes. gays or bisexuals? or Yes, something? many, many okay. of them come. So, uh, they, they generally pushed by their parents. Okay. They okay. themselves don't want to come. Mm. But I have had some very insightful and interesting experiences with them. Mm. Mm. And uh, I want to say that in, I won't say in all cases because that's not happening, but in a couple of them, trust me, they were able to reverse it. Mm. And that was amazing for me. One case that just comes to my mind is of a, of a young girl um, mm. who had been sent by her parents actually because they wanted her to get married and all that. And she obviously didn't want to get married. Mm. And... Um, you know, I remember when she entered my clinic, her walk, mm. you know, uh, I noticed that she didn't have earrings. Mm. Um, she had worn jeans and a shirt, cut her hair short. And she spoke about uh, the fact that she's okay with who she is. Her mm. parents are not okay. And so she's come for a session. Mm. I can't recall the session, of course. But after the session, she felt mm. much better. And she said, do you think it's going to help me? I said, do you mm. want to be helped? Mm. The fact that you've asked me this question 
indicates that somewhere deep down you want to be helped or you feel that yes I don't want to experience this altered sexuality mm -hmm. so she left mm -hmm. two months later her mother called me up mm -hmm. And she, she was smiling, maybe on the phone, because I could sense that she was smiling. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she said that I have to share something with you. I mm -hmm. thank you. I said, what happened? So she said that she was at home. She is not on her job. So she was helping me to cook in mm -hmm. the kitchen. And mm -hmm. she said, I noticed that just as she was putting vegetables. Before, she was putting it like this. Now, she is putting it in a very nice way. She, the girl had also got her ears pierced. Okay. Wow. And uh, her mother had got, instead of kurta, she had got kurtis. Mm -hmm. And the girl was wearing it. Okay. And uh, so she was very happy with this change. change. You know? So she said, I want to do another session with you. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, when she comes to Bombay. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay. so three months later, the girl called up and said, I want to come. Okay. Okay. So she came for her session, second session. Post that, she gave me a call, which was very interesting. She said that uh, I, I went to a, a pub, rather a discotheque mm -hmm. with some of her girlfriends. And, uh, you know, when she was standing at the bar, she was surprised that a guy approached her. And asked her to dance. She said it has never happened in my life ever till now. Mm -hmm. So was I exuding or radiating some other kind of energy for a guy to come and approach me? So I said maybe. So you yeah. know change can happen. But like mm -hmm. I said it has to come from the client. Mm -hmm. The client has to be wanting to uh, create a shift. So maybe the soul of this person was at that tipping point mm. you know where she wanted to experience being a woman mm. in love with a man mm. rather than a woman in love with another woman that's all that's a paradigm shift in a person's yes. Uh, yes. thinking or the way she feels because so because now what is being uh, promoted is that it's not an anomaly uh, being a gay or a bisexual or a transgender, it's not an anomaly, it's okay, it's part of nature. And so people should stop judging and start accepting such people for who they are, which is, I think it's perfectly fine and we must do it. We must not really discriminate any against anybody. But it's also very interesting to note what you just shared, that the uh, souls like these have some kind of a deep conditioning which they want, they're carrying and which they don't want to let go and they want to experience uh, something like this where they might feel like a man from within but they are in a, a female body and they're kind of uh, repelling against it and then a shift happens and they are perfectly fine so I so this entire human experience is uh, so mutable and there's nothing fixed about uh, who we are and the only way to facilitate these changes is to first start ex accepting such people and stop condemning them because the more we condemn them, the more they uh, start clinging very strongly to this identity and perhaps but there is not challenges. To condemn. So. Yeah, that's do what, we, that's what do we kind of condemn a dog? Do we condemn yes, a plant? Yes, do we yes, condemn yes. a plant? Do yeah. we condemn a flower? Uh, so uh, this, uh, this, this stigma that this uh, stigma which is uh, uh, attached to them, it, it, uh, there is a great uh, uh, movement going on to remove it and uh, Make them to and to make human beings more accepting of uh, others, others of their ilk. So I think it's a very uh, yeah. a positive change in people's mind, which should lead to a more egalitarian world where we have space for everybody. Like Great, I said, uh, Shivi, past life therapy is a is a therapy which creates a paradigm shift in the mind of mm. the therapist, in the mind of the client, in the mind of the client's parents, relatives, mm. Mm. because there is nothing fixed. Yes. yes. So There's we are nothing not fixed human beings. We are, we are here for a temporary existence. Mm. And we can have any kind of existence. Mm. So why judge anybody for anything for that? Anything. 
Mm-hmm. Any color of the skin or you know your age or whatever, it does not matter. It's very okay. interesting time that we are here. Okay. So, uh, wait, wait. Dr. Jain, uh, we also hear about things like future life progression. Yeah. So how true it is? Because according to me, your future is created in the now. How you decide to play your life in the current lifetime, the kind yeah. of decisions and choices you make will it determine your future life. Yeah. So how how far is this uh, valid of this future life progression where you kind of go in a trance to see that what you're going to be in future if you take a certain path or you continue to uh, walk the path you are walking right now? Is it like, uh, is it a fantasy or is it a reality? I'm always uh, perplexed about I, this. I think that if we can just make our present better, yes. it will be good enough. Uh, because future life progression will... Suppose you see that in the future life, you're going to be a great monk. Mm. What have you done so far? And like I told you, it's very difficult for people to integrate experiences. Mm. So even if I see my future life as a great monk, I am nowhere close to that. Mm. So uh, what am I going to do about it? Maybe I'll be mm. just happy. Chalo, your future life, I'll be a monk. Abhi mm. jo karna mein, let me enjoy myself. Mm. Okay. So it's not, I, I don't think it's required, is mm. the first thing. You know, mm. you don't do things which are not going to give you insight of your current lifetime. Mm. Because it is now mm. that I can create a future. How do I see, I, I'm not able to first of all understand how do I see a future life mm. when, my, when my current, when my yeah. now is not uh, in that space. Mm. Mm. Right? So According to me, maybe, I don't know. I don't do future life progression, Shri okay. Yes. I believe that the power is important. The important thing is to get people to understand their past, understand their karmic loops that they are in, understand how to improve their karmic transactions with the human beings around them, and to create a better future in your current lifetime. Because moment till the end of this life... If you can be close to that monk that you're going to be in the future, good enough. Mm. But it's very important to understand that there is what we call sanchit karma. The accumulated karma, Mm. which is a big ocean. Mm. So you may see a future lifetime, let's say, after you Mm. die in this lifetime. It may not be your immediate future lifetime. It may be some future lifetime. Mm. that you may experience. So how do you know it's going to be the immediate future? Mm. Because when you die and you get back to your sanchit karma, you may realize mm. that, oh my God, this monk lifetime is too far away. Abhi I have to deal with many other lifetimes. Mm. So, you know, I don't think it's required to do all this mm. future regression, future life regression. And all. Mm. I don't, uh, I mean, I don't endorse it. Endorse it. So, uh, Dr. Jen, also tell us something about that transgenerational healing which you are dabbling currently. What is it about and is it possible for us to uh, not only heal ourselves but also generations to come and the generations before us through... uh, If if that is what it it, it is about, I'm just kind of uh, presuming. Yeah. Yeah. The transgenerational healing is a fascinating uh, area that... Mm -hmm. A therapist can learn and understand. Mm. As we know, transgenerational means we are dealing with the DNA. Mm. Mm. If you read the DNA of a reverse, it's and, A and D, mm. indicating that we have to include everyone mm. who is part of your soul script. So the world has to, the world can only function if we are coming from an inclusive space. But the problem is that we are excluding everybody. Isko hatao, isko hatao. Mm-hmm. So in transgenerational healing, we mm-hmm. understand how we are our own ancestor. Mm-hmm. If I have a problem and it is coming from my ancestral tree, it could be coming from an ancestor who is me. So this is very interesting to understand. Mm-hmm. It's not somebody else who is my ancestor. And that ancestor is causing me grief. It is I who is an ancestor. My own ancestor. So if I have been, let's say, an aunt who passed away 
in the third or the fourth uh, generation. Mm. And I'm born again. And I did something there mm. which is affecting me only. So when you do transgenerational healing, you actually realize that you are in this family tree and mm. you are somebody who was in this family generations ago also. And you have done something which is harming you today. Not somebody else is not harming me. Mm. So this is how the connectivity of your soul tribe starts getting um, understood by you. Mm. So I can share my own experience of trans. Yeah, please do. I'm looking forward. To yes. So uh, in my family, my paternal side, mm. uh, my uh, uncles, so my father's two brothers, my father's two cousin brothers, and maybe others also, um, had what we call closed angle glaucoma. So glaucoma, as you know, is an eye condition mm. where people go blind. There are two kinds of glaucoma, open angle glaucoma and closed angle glaucoma. Closed angle glaucoma is more serious and closed, uh, sorry, open angle glaucoma is more serious. In closed angle glaucoma, you can put eye drops and you can, I mean, you don't need to go blind basically. But uh, this is the history of my family. Now, suddenly in 2015, I was diagnosed with glaucoma. Now, I was surprised because nobody in the family, except one female, who was my father's bua, aunt, who was a child mm -hmm. widow, went blind. Mm -hmm. Nobody else. So, now I know that I can be my own ancestor. Mm -hmm. Correct? And mm -hmm. the bua passed away before I was born. So, mm -hmm. I've never seen her, right? Now, when I did the transgenerational healing, I realized that I was that bua. And this, I didn't know the story. I came to know the story later on that she was, uh, she was old, about 80 or something. She had gone blind for many, many years. And she had, uh, in, in a fit of rage, cursed some men. Mm -hmm. Now, what I saw was, I was this bua, but I was also an ancestor who had cursed men. Because they yeah. had ousted um, they had uh, ousted me out of my house and stuff like that. And that time I was not blind. Mm. But I cursed them that you will be, I mean, you will, you know, be blind or uh, you will not be able to see the light of the day kind of stuff. So I realized I am me. Mm. I am the aunt. Mm. And I am an ancestor. So my soul has traveled through lifetimes in different bodies, in the same family, right? And you wouldn't believe it. After this experience, the same eye drops that I was putting for six to eight months, mm -hmm. they began to turn my eye red. The doctor was surprised and then he told me that I better go again for the test. And I went back again for the test. They told me I don't have glaucoma. And during this transgenerational experience, I was crying. I could feel as if the energy blocks, mm -hmm. the hatches mm -hmm. had opened, you know, and as if that energy was just leaving me. And with great love, mm -hmm. and kindness, mm -hmm. I forgave all those men. Mm -hmm. So it's very important, it's a very powerful healing, very, mm. very powerful. But you have to understand it. Mm. You have to go with the intention mm. of getting some answers, not just the healing, mm. because it's not the transgenerational healing heals everybody, by the way. You have to be ready to receive that, mm. because receiving is very important, uh, Shrivi. Mm. Most people, you know, they don't receive healing. Like they say, if you're giving healing to some person, has to receive it, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, when something as deep as this is done, you have mm -hmm. to receive, you know, you have to receive that healing, which is very powerful. I mean, I know this because I know I know what happened to me. Mm -hmm. So I know how powerful it was. It was just one session. 
So is it possible to escape your family karma? For example, there is a family, okay. And there are people inside who are always at loggerheads and always at each other's throats. And you know, there's a war going on inside a particular extended family. And there's one person who's trying to heal or uh, heal himself or grow, grow spiritually, himself or herself. And they are also trying to resolve these issues within the family. They are trying to uh, heal others also, introduce them to spiritual work so that they can also grow. But it's not cutting any ice with other family members. So in such a case, is it possible for that person to stay unaffected from the drama which is happening inside the family? Or, uh, you know, he, today or tomorrow in the future, he or she would also be drawn into that family drama no matter how much she has or he has worked on herself so what is going to play out eventually if you see that one person is trying very hard to evolve but the extended family is just not waking up to it and then uh, we don't see any light at the end of the tunnel in a case like this i can only tell you that the path of spirituality is a lonely one mm -hmm. so if there is a person in a family which is a a lot of, lot, lot of feud is happening in the family, mm -hmm. arguments and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. This person who is following the path of spirituality will have to focus on his or her path. Mm -hmm. It does not matter what others are doing. Mm -hmm. You will have to learn to walk alone. It's a difficult path. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a story of Lord Buddha, if mm -hmm. I may say that, when he was leaving the palace in the middle of the night, mm. uh, he went to his wife's uh, chamber, mm. stood outside wife's chamber, looked inside, saw his wife and his child who was just, I think, a day old, sleeping. Mm. And he wanted to tell her that, you know, I'm leaving. Mm. For a second, split second, it is said that um, the Lord had an insight and he said, if I enter and tell my wife, she will give me reasons why not to leave. But if I don't leave, then I will not be true to myself. And that's how he left in the middle of the night. So we have to understand, you know, that the path that we have taken, which is towards the divine, not that we're going to reach the divine in this lifetime, but we have begun this journey. Mm -hmm. Healers, spiritual seekers, right? Now, you will have many people who will pull you down. Mm. They will push you, they will pull you, they will tell you a lot of reasons why that is not the path you should take. But you have to stand firm. Mm. You have to stand firm. There is no other way or you will give in. Okay. So another question that's coming to my mind is related to curses which you just said. You just shared that there was a an ancestor who had cursed uh, the male members of her family. Now, when we look at our scriptures or the folklore, so it is full of stories related to curses. And it's got, it used to be mostly very ascended masters which used to curse those wrongdoers. Ki tumara, no, tumara ye ka janam ho jayega, tum, uh, even those, uh, those figures like Ravan and other demonic figures are uh, considered as cursed uh, beings which were cursed by those those, you know, Sanat, Kum, Sanat Kumaras or seven yeah. Saptarshis that uh, you, you people, yeah, people, you, you have grown very arrogant and therefore you are condemned to live the life of a demon. So, and then we see that the, their, their life stories actually play out according to the curse that was uh, you know, given to them. And then eventually they find their salvation uh, when the divine himself comes down and kind of kills them and then they go to that dham. So here the curse is playing a very uh, a meaningful role in yeah. a person's life. Whereas, uh, whereas now listening to you, it feels that all of us have the capacity to curse others and eventually reap the consequences of the same curses which we put on others. So does it mean that uh, not everybody is qualified to curse and, and we, we should not be because it's eventually for you to be, uh, to, to stay unscathed, from your own, uh, say, anger, it is very important that you give it, you know, it, we, are, we as human beings should not even do it in the first place. Or uh, it's only very, very qualified beings who can do it in such a way so that it eventually brings out good and doesn't harm people. 
because otherwise even these curses should come back to those rishis also that is the cycle of life दरवाजा ऋषि को कभी हमने नहीं सुना कि वो बेचारे परेशान हो गए कि भैया मैंने इसको उसको कर्ज किया था और अब बेचारे खुद उसका कॉन्सिक्वेंसेस रीप कर रहा हूँ शिवी दैट डिवाइन तत्व इज ऑल्सो इन आर सोनली नो करेक्ट तो व्हेन आई इन माय एंसेस्ट्रल स्पेस व्हेन आई कर्स समबडी राइट दैट डिवाइन तत्व इन मी मस्ट हैव टोल्ड मी दैट ओके यू हैव डन दिस बट यू विल हैव टू आर यू रेडी to um, suffer the consequences hmm. right obviously right? Hmm. so that divine rishi must have told me that are you ready to suffer the consequences so i must have said yes so i i must have said that can i get out of it in some way so he may have told me yes you'll have to do some kind of penance tapas hmm. right so hmm. you we all are here only to do penance by the way our life that we have taken as a human being is to do penance for all the nonsensical karmic stuff that we have done if you receive and accept the penance and do it good for you if you don't then good for you i mean you'll have to go on and live many more lives so mm. the awareness part comes in here chidi mm. so as i become more aware mm. right i will start changing my behavior mm. i will start changing my thoughts my emotions my feelings i will learn to become more inclusive mm. i will learn to drop judgment mm. yeah i will learn all this right during this journey so a curse is not something that you should be scared of that is also serving a great purpose in your life mm. it is making you understand the negative Mm. and it is drawing you towards the positive no mm. right because that's the purpose of life mm. if i am sick i go to a doctor and i heal myself mm. similarly the curse is like a sickness mm. that is being bestowed on me mm. so what do i have to do i have to go to a doctor to heal myself and the doctor is me only okay because i am the ancestor i will have to heal myself But is it is it also important for the one who is being cursed to be in that state of accepting that energy? Because if for he or she does not believe that this curse is going to affect me, I don't think it will uh, play out like that. If you get get scared and you believe that oh really, uh, no, this curse will eventually come uh, come to pass. It I it will happen to me. It will play out. And if you feel that it's all uh, useless and it's not going to affect me, it will not have any effect. Is it? Shivi, this is uh-huh. where I want to say that what I can only talk from my experience, right? right. With my uh-huh. clients and my patients and myself. So I know one thing hmm. that it is I hmm. who is creating this life, and it is I who is creating the contracts with people in this life. Hmm. It is I who is going to foster the relationship with the divine hmm. uh, element also. So hmm. it is I. i mane the big i okay not the small i the ego mm. it is this i who is realizing that okay i am in this physical body and what do i have to do here i better start doing it now because otherwise i'm going to carry this forward that understanding and realization i have to have otherwise this life is a waste shivi it's a complete waste now mm. i want to bring this thing here because you said this about uh the if i am only cursing myself then obviously the power is in me to get out of that also mm-hmm. right now there are a lot of people who are in a habit of blaming others mere sath ye problem ho rahi hai because so and so has done some black magic on me mm-hmm. and so because of that person i'm suffering she has cursed me right now the thing is if somebody has cursed you you have attracted that towards you right like attracts like so there must be something in you mm. that has attracted this curse energy towards you mm. so what do you have to do now what do you have to do you don't have to you know uh, keep blaming and criticizing and doing all this in and doing some uh, havan to take that let that person suffer and not you because if they if the premise of spirituality is inclusion 
then I will have to include that person in the gambit of my love. Now, these are all difficult things. Shri. It's not easy to do all this, okay? Mm-hmm. It's not. It's very easy to say, oh, I'm going to love everybody and then uh, affirm, tap, tap, tap. You know, I love the whole world. I love everybody. <laughs> it's very easy to do that. But do you really, from your core, understand the philosophy of inclusion? Then mm-hmm. only can you. This is something that I tell a lot of my clients that, okay, that person is making you suffer. He, because of him, you know, I'm having losses in my business. Okay. Now you have a lot of money. So I tell him, I tell that person, okay, you have the ability to earn money. He said, yes. I said, okay. Can you give 30% of your ability to earn money to this person who is cursing you? Can you provide 30% of your ability? Mm-hmm. Can you gift it in your prayer to this person? Mm-hmm. The person said, if I give him 30% of my ability, then I will be full. You have 70% ability, right? The problem is fear. Human beings are very fearful, Shivi. We say that we are generous and kind and giving and we are able to give love. Are love not love. You need to be success. You need to be skill. What can you give to the person? No, we cannot. So it's very easy to say I want to evolve spiritually. Evolving spiritually means to die empty. Empty of everything. What you have collected in this lifetime. Can you do that? Can you give away 100% of your kindness to somebody? Can you give away 100% of your success and fame to somebody? You won't. You can't. This is the problem. The problem is not all this. The problem is that as human beings, we do not want to give away anything to anybody because we believe we are separate from the other person. Mm-hmm. Moment this philosophy of coming together, we are one. Sablo bolte, oneness. Mm-hmm. We are one, we are one, we are one, aham, brahmasmi uh, and all that. But are you believing that? No. 10% of your fame, will you gift it to somebody who does not have any? You say, no, no, no. Because we are so fearful. These are not easy things to do. They're very difficult to do. So the path of spirituality is very tough. It's mm-hmm. not easy. You have to... First of all, understand the philosophy. Then you have to walk on it. Then you have to suffer also. You have to suffer. Suffering is a step to salvation. So suffer. Are you willing to suffer? Because you have to. You will. You will. That's beautiful. I think that's very profound of what you just said, uh, Dr. J. Uh, there's one last question which is there on my mind. Uh, as a therapist, as a a healer, as a psychologist, you get to listen to a lot of distressing things for people, very deep and dark secrets, which perhaps they might not be comfortable themselves uh, in privy to knowing it or even facing it. And then they come and they offload everything before you. It's not easy for anybody to stay with this kind of experience and be sane because experiences are diverse and they are they can be very very painful so how do you manage your sanity your your uh, you know how do you keep your balance your cool and calm uh, despite the kind of work that you do like i said the path of spirituality is tough and mm-hmm. second i have i've realized over the years that i have my own story mm-hmm. which i'm living mm-hmm. and that story maybe i'm towards the end of it I have a few more chapters to go. And those are their stories. They mm-hmm. have nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah? They, 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 are, they are part of my stories because obviously I've learned so much from them. Mm-hmm. I can definitely write about them in my book. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. their story is not my story. I learned this very early in my life mm-hmm. that we all have our own stories. We all have the beginning, middle and end of our story that we have to manage. So do not get influenced by other people's stories. Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes to see me, Mm -hmm. I create, there's a physical distance. 
obviously. And you also create a mental distance from them because mm -hmm. there is something in psychology which we call transference and counter-transference. So we know that we do not have to transfer and counter-transfer with our client, right? Mm -hmm. And the moment I walk out of my room, I leave behind that story. I never carry it with me ever. I've never done that in my life mm -hmm. because I've understood that that is that does not belong to me. I've learned something. Mm -hmm. The the learning I have taken, mm -hmm. but not the life. Yeah. So I have to be very very. Uh, I have to understand. It's all about understanding, Shivi, and implementing. So uh, when can we expect to see your new book in the market? Based on all the diverse experience, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I, I'm waiting to send it to a. a Publisher house. Okay, so it's already written. Great. Yes, it's already written 355 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm waiting to get into a like approach a publishing house, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know what happens, Shivi, is that when you uh, when you write a book mm -hmm. uh, and you reread the book, that is mm -hmm. a horrible thing to do. Mm -hmm. So when you reread the book again or you read the chapter again, pretty much all dull did they? Mm. So that's the uh, dangerous part, uh, I think, of writing a book. So yeah, the book is ready. Mm. Everything is ready. The cover is also ready. Uh, <laughs> the cover has been designed by one of my students, Niharika. Beautiful cover, exactly what mm. I wanted. She's thought of it and she's given it to me. Mm. And But now I need the publisher. So I should have put actually, life positive. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, life positive books division is not functional anymore. But there are so many publishers that I know of. Uh, I think that there's uh, Yogi Impressions and there's Zen Books and so many other. So uh, <laughs> you can you can always, always <laughs> we can work out a sell uh, work out a solution. And Doctor Jen, you know. Any publisher who comes to know that book has been authored by you <laughs> will come rushing to your doorsteps. You don't even need to approach anybody. You simply have to pass on the word and publishers will make a beeline outside of, out of your house because they know that book is going to be a bestseller. <laughs> we, we know that there, there, there's no doubt about it. So uh, publishing is not something which you need to actually worry about. And I'm sure even you know about this. So thank you so much, Dr. Jain. It was wonderful, wonderful talking to you. You have amassed so many pearls of wisdom from your life experiences. Uh, everybody has so much to learn from you. And I'm very grateful to have, to have uh, interviewed you today, to have listened to you today, to have learned so much from you today. And so have all the viewers tonight, this show. Thank you so much for being thank there. Thank you so much. Shivya. Thank you all so best. much. Yeah. Looking forward to reading your book. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank Have you. a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.